All right, so here we go. Today we have uh, Ted Hartwell, and this is going to be a wonderful talk on the impact of the games we play. And uh, and so if you're going to click it, there we go. Some of the announcements. So again, remember uh, Sam Quinones is coming out on November second. Uh, he wrote the book uh, Dreamland. Should be a fabulous uh, show that day. So keep that on your schedule. Don't miss that one. Yes, and tell all your friends. Yes, please. And then other upcoming and next week, um, Renee Critchlow, who used to be the president of the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians, who's now in Boston, is coming on to talk about a lot of health equity things. I know a lot of us heard her throughout the COVID epidemic give a lot of talks for us. So haven't talked to her in a while. It's going to be super exciting. Um, and then you can kind of see other topics. We do have the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Mary Delaquil, who people requested to come back to really kind of talk about the different data and the different changes. So stay tuned there. As always, you all got the alert that this is being recorded. If you can turn your video on, we don't care if you're eating, that's totally cool. Please chat in questions if you have them. And if there's more than one person in your room, please send a chat as well so we can make sure everybody gets credit. And the CME form, you'll see the link at the end of the talk somewhere in the chat. Otherwise, you will get that email to fill out, please. All right. Remember, if you need some help with a patient, uh, just give us a ring. You can also call uh, our friend Erin. She might be on today. Uh, she helps manage some of our state programs. So please uh, keep that in mind. But yeah, patient issues, please call. And the online resource center where you can connect with Echoes and find out everything that's going on the manual. I think a lot of the people on here, several people have been reviewing it. Um, and hopefully it'll be up soon. But if you need any information on any topic, you want workflows, protocols, all that, please just email us. Yeah. And remember the Addiction Connection podcast. Uh, we just released one late last night on opioids, depression, and suicide, um, which uh, is was super fun to do. There's going to be a <laughs> couple more. I shouldn't say it was super fun. It's <laughs> disturbing at times and sad. But uh, there's going to probably be two or three episodes linked to that. So um, just uh, be aware that just got loose. All right. So with that, we are going to introduce, I'm not going to go through your whole bio. You are welcome to introduce yourself. I know you kind of chit chatted a little bit at the beginning, but if you want to give a short introduction, uh, Ted Hartwell, who is coming to us from um, Las Vegas virtually. So we had to go to Vegas today rather than Apple Betty Day. So please, by all means, if you want to share your slide, you can get started at any point. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Heather. And I appreciate the opportunity to come speak to all of you today about uh, the impacts of the games we play. So this presentation will be focused on, on a gaming disorder, which has officially been recognized by the World Health Organization. American Psychiatric Association has not yet formally recognized it as a standalone disorder, but most of us are expecting uh, that in an upcoming iteration, we will see that uh, formally recognized. I'll talk a little bit about that. During this presentation, I was glad to hear the the attention to um, uh, suicide, especially this past past month. Um, I will be talking about uh, problem gambling as well, which has one of the highest suicide rates of any mental health disorder. It's about three times the rate of the substance use disorders, um, and there's often a lot of co-occurrence um, with substance use disorders. In fact, people who are diagnosed with a gambling problem, depending on the study you look at, between 40 and 70% of them will suffer from a co-occurring co substance use disorder. It's not nearly as high coming the other direction, uh, but it's still not insignificant. About 10 to 15% of people who are diagnosed with a substance use disorder will also screen as having a gambling disorder if they are asked the questions. And so we always are encouraging uh, those of you who work in in uh, treatment or screening in the substance use realm, please add some screening questions um, on on gambling. Um, and uh, and even those of you who who may be in the you know primary care physician uh, realm, if you're asking questions about um, uh, prescription and or other drug use, alcohol consumption, consider adding a question or two about gambling uh, and be prepared to refer people to resources if you think it may be. Uh, uh, an issue. So uh, just a very brief background about myself. Um, 
I am in long-term recovery uh, from a gambling disorder. Made my last bet on September 14th, 2007. So just celebrated 15 years uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, my professional background is actually in anthropology with an emphasis in archaeology. So for the first 10 years of my professional career, uh, I was an archaeologist at the Desert Research Institute here in Las Vegas, which is the nonprofit environmental research arm of the Nevada System of Higher Education. That morphed, uh, and there's a whole other one-hour presentation about how I came to run the off-site radiological monitoring program around the Nevada test site where this country tested nuclear weapons for four decades. But long story short, in the middle of all that, um, I developed that gambling disorder, which affected all areas of my life, from uh, work to productivity to uh, you know, cause some uh, security issues with some of my positions. Um, also a, a professional cellist with the Las Vegas Philharmonic. It had some impact on uh, parts of my music career. Uh, and so as I got into recovery from that illness, I became very interested in the idea of public advocacy uh, and first began working as a volunteer to help administer some of the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling uh, programs here in Nevada. And ultimately that morphed into a a consultancy, which takes up about half my time these days. And one year from now, I plan to be full time at the Nevada Council on, on Problem Gambling. So uh, very briefly, that's that's my background. Let me share my screen here. Excellent. And I may need, you know, if, if questions pop up in the chat and you want to, oh, wait, I can see it, I think. Oh, excellent. And yes, thank you. Thank you for the congratulations here. Um, so first of all, just a uh, brief commercial on who the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling is. We basically have a mission of generating awareness, promoting education, and advocating for quality treatment of problem gambling in the state of Nevada. And we do that by working with all stakeholders who are willing uh, to work uh, with us to provide sustainable programs and services that reduce the impact of problem gambling in Nevada. Uh, we are not part of the state, although we do get about 25% of our funding um, from a competitive grant that we go after each uh, biennium. The other 75% is contributions from individuals as well as the gaming industry. We are an affiliate of the National Council on Problem Gambling. Um, I'm uh, honored to serve on the board of directors for that organization. But as an affiliate of the National Council, we do not take a position for or against legalized gambling, which enables us to work with stakeholders across the entire spectrum. We just want to be a resource for individuals who are struggling or people in their lives who are affected. Um, the National Council on Problem Gambling has a state affiliate in all of these states in uh, light blue. Uh, they do manage the uh, National Problem Gambling Helpline, which is accessible from all 50 states in the U.S. territories. And I'm excited to announce that that is changing from a, a very um, unrecognizable number that was this 522-4700 number to 800 Gambler, which was uh, is actually owned by the um, compulsive uh, uh, the, the Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey, and we reached a leasing agreement for uh, the next six years at least so that we can manage that in all states outside of New Jersey. So that 800 gambler number will work 24-7 uh, from any state or U.S. territory to connect you to uh, resources uh, at your location at any time. You'll notice Minnesota is one of those states that does have an affiliate council. So I, I did want to plug them. Susan Sheridan Tucker is the executive director of the Minnesota Alliance on Problem Gambling. Her contact information is here. Uh, she also serves on the board of directors for the National Council. A uh, fantastic person. I would encourage you uh, for any future presentations, you know, directly related to resources in Minnesota to please reach out. Um, to that organization. I do notice they have some stuff on gaming as well on their website. Um, brief trigger warning, uh, many of the slides in this presentation contain gaming and gambling imagery, just in case any of you are, are uh, affected by that type of uh, imagery. But in the beginning, uh, there was Pong. And those of you of a certain age um, will recognize this, probably most of you will in any case. This was one of the first uh, arcade style games that you could buy and hook up to your TV at home. And it was my first recollection as a child of, of owning and playing a video game 
system uh, at home. This originally started out as kind of a homework assignment for a software engineer, and the um, organization was so happy with it, they marketed it as an arcade game starting in 1972. And then by 1975, you could purchase this for your home. And so uh, upon uh, my my um, my mother's second divorce uh, up in Spokane, Washington, I decided, I guess I needed a father figure in my life. I moved down to Lubbock, Texas, which was quite a, a culture shot going from Spokane, Washington to Lubbock, Texas, and not understanding most of what people were saying. And uh, while I doubt that I could have qualified for what we call a gaming disorder today, I, I certainly started to use video games in a problematic fashion fairly early on in my life to uh, escape from a lot of unpleasant things that were going on in my father's household. Um, very soon afterwards, Atari came out with um, this system, the Atari 2600, uh, which I also owned. In researching this in, in this past spring, I, I came across this one for sale on eBay for $1,800. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we probably only spent a couple hundred bucks for it back in 1977. But if you've got a working function and copy now, it's worth a lot more. And as I was researching the uh, game cassettes that came with that uh, system, uh, I came across this one called Casino, which immediately uh, sparked a memory. I, I had no recollection of actually playing casino games on this Atari platform until I saw this cartridge. And then I remembered owning this uh, this cartridge. It had, I think, uh, probably blackjack um, uh, on it, five card stud, something like that. Um, you know, one of the things we know about gambling disorder is that early exposure to and participation in gambling activities raises the risk of developing a gambling disorder later on in life. And a lot of the people I talked to who have gambling disorders started as kids. So one of the best things we all can do is delay our children's exposure to, but especially participation in gambling activities uh, of any kind, whether that's scratch off, um, you know, bingo for money, those Super Bowl squares and March Madness things we all love to do in our families at home. This is an adult activity and there's, there's good reason to keep it an adult activity. Um, shortly thereafter, we had some of the early home computer systems. This is one I owned, which also came with cartridges that had gambling activities that I, I had not remembered until I, again, started researching uh, these in the past spring. And, you know, who, who can forget very shortly after the, the ability to uh, save the games onto cassette, transmit these to friends, and eventually this would lead to our, our dial-up uh, connections. And all the nostalgia for me when I hear this this tone, and possibly for many of you, had those early systems you know, connecting to AOL on Was the connection going to be successful? What was going to happen? And so um, this this all uh, kind of was an early precursor for me into my gambling activity. I was introduced. Um, to gambling by my father at the same time uh, as I was these video game systems. Uh, a lot of our family trips used to be traveling to Rio Doso, New Mexico from Lubbock, Texas, where there's a horse race track. And we would camp in the mountains outside of town, which was tremendous fun as a kid. Although I'd come to suspect later on in life, it's probably so my father could save money on the hotels so that he had more to gamble on the horses. But be that as it may, um, uh, it was it was uh, fun as a kid, and we would spend the whole day at the track, which was also fun because my dad would give each of the kids 20 bucks, and that was ours to gamble on the horses. So while he was the one making the bets at the window, obviously, by the age of 10, I was already very familiar with the, uh, the jargon and the programs, the history of the horses, and I'd tell my dad which horses to make bets on. By the time I was a teenager, he taught me how to play poker. Um, I'm the one in the middle, by the way, in case there's uh, any doubt. And um, uh, this, this became a regular part of my life by the time I was in high school, playing in a regular weekly, weekly uh, poker game. So um, I, I would stay in Lubbock to go to school at Texas Tech. I would also get my graduate degree in anthropology, working at a pretty well-known archeological site right outside of town. And then out of graduate school, got offered a job in Las Vegas, which I was pretty uh, um, happy about because uh, you know, not only was I uh, 
the big joke in my family, if, you know, if the archaeology doesn't work out for you, Ted, you've got your music to fall back on. Ha ha. Um, uh, both of those things worked out very well for me in Las Vegas. But my big fantasy was about the World Series of poker and saving up ten thousand dollars to try and enter that tournament to see if I could make it to the to the big table. Uh, I set aside my gaming for a little while, uh, but in the late 1990s, we saw the beginning of, of what are called massively multiplayer online role-playing games. And these are these role-playing games that you can log onto you know, various servers from across the world, interact with, with uh, real people in that universe, chat real time. And these were already available by the 1990s. And I was one of the earlier consumers of this at the same time that I was engaging uh, in uh, some gambling activity, not only in the casinos in Las Vegas, but um, uh, uh, online when the legality of that was still kind of in a, in a gray area. And even by this time, this is an article from 2000, the virtual items that were being uh, created and won and used in these games actually became a, a commodity uh, online. You, you started to see on eBay uh, some characters that people had built up or weapons or armor starting to sell for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. People had invested lots of time into making these characters, but the line really started to be blurred uh, over over 20 years ago on some of these issues because now uh, you know you could you could buy, sell, and trade, uh, and um, uh, while not really gamble yet at this point, uh, it was becoming um, uh, uh, very uh, connected. So uh, before I go any further in the ga gaming universe, I do want to talk about uh, what I mean when I when I say gambling and define that. Here in, La in Las Vegas or Nevada, if you say the word gambling, people's minds, of course, go immediately to the casinos and that environment. Uh, but the key elements of gambling are essentially prize, consideration, and chance. And, and a good general working definition is, of gambling is wagering something of value and that could be cash or not. It could be something else of value to you to try and win something of value where the outcome is uncertain. And that's whether it's based on chance or skill or a combination of two. I'll have poker players and sports bettors sometimes, you know, argue that you know those are uh, those are games of skill. They are not gambling. But all of these contain significant elements of, of chance and therefore meet the the generally accepted um, definition of gambling. And so I ask people, which of these can be gambling? I have fun with the kids, especially in the schools when we're talking about this. And some of these are kind of a no brainer, slot machines, blackjack, uh, a bingo, horse racing, sports betting, lottery. Some of these start to get a little neb nebulous. It's like raffle, is raffle gambling? I don't know, I'm, you know, it's for a, for a good cause, you know, poker video games? And the answer really is all of the above. If there's a wager involved, um, there's a bet, there's money or some other, um, something of value being uh, changing hands with, with one person winning. Uh, again, the, these are all things that are gambling. So here's some, some general facts about gambling. There is some form of gambling that is legal in 48 of 50 states. The only two states in the country where gambling is entirely illegal are Utah and Hawaii. And there's plenty of illegal gambling going on in, in both of those states. Uh, and there are gamblers anonymous meetings happening in both of those states. About 85% of adults report having gambled at least once in their lifetime, 70% uh, of youth, and about two thirds report having gambled in the past year. And of course, the great majority of people who choose to gamble can do so for fun and entertainment. They can set those limits of both money and time and stick to the plan most of the time. They can gamble at appropriate times, uh, not uh, times that they are supposed to be at work, for example, which is when uh, in my final two years of gambling, I was doing most of my gambling to hide the fact from my family that I was even gambling. And uh, my supervisor lived in a different city. It was easy for me to delegate a lot of my responsibilities to other faculty and students that I should have been doing and take off for a long lunch, take off for lunch, not come back at all. Sometimes call in sick to work. As far as my then wife knew, uh, I was at work. And as far as work knew, I was homesick. And meanwhile, I was blowing my brains out at the casino, desperately trying to win back uh, a massive amount of debt that I had lost gambling. And of course, the vast majority of people who choose to gamble don't experience any long-term uh, you know, progressive negative effects. 
I'm not going to go through all the signs and symptoms of a gambling disorder, but these are the nine criteria from the DSM-5 uh, to diagnose a gambling disorder. If you meet at least four of these, you are clinically diagnosable, although an answer of of uh, you know an affirmative answer to any one of these is probably a good time for a brief intervention or a conversation or a little self-reflection because there is uh, evidence in the research literature that suggests it, it's not just a chronic and progressive thing, this disorder, that people move in and out of various phases of this, uh, maybe as many of a as a third who actually meet a clinical diagnosis, find a way to recover uh, somehow without any outside intervention or treatment but the, the other two thirds, which is certainly the group I fall into, uh, needs some assistance of some kind, whether that's treatment, uh, self-help groups like Gamblers Anonymous, uh, what have you. And by the time I actually reported for treatment, I was a nine for nine. In fact, when I came into treatment and it was still DSM-4 and they still had the uh, Commission of Illegal Acts to finance gambling. And so I was a, a, a 10, 10 for 10 in all of those criteria. The reason I put up these, I, I put these up will become clear, I think, when I when I start talking about gaming disorder here in a moment. So let's change gears now and, and talk about gaming disorder and specifically why we're starting to talk about that so much right now. And the pandemic is actually partly responsible for this. Um, as all of you know, uh, on this presentation, uh, the pandemic has brought us all of those risk factors associated with pretty much the entire spectrum of mental health disorders, including addictive disorders, the social isolation that's uh, resulted for all of us as a result of that. Uh, many of us, I think all of us have experienced some type of loss during that time, whether it's loss of loved ones, relationships, financial security, connection to services we generally enjoy, and the depression and anxiety that goes along with all of that. Um, and at the same time, or actually even shortly before the pandemic, the video game industry had already become worth more than the film and music industries combined. Uh, $57 billion on spending in 2020 uh, during the pandemic, which was a U.S. record, significant worldwide worth of the industry. 2020, uh, premium console gaming, and that these are things uh, like Xboxes, Wiis, PlayStations, these consoles that a lot of people own, $18 billion for that alone, and then free-to-play PC and uh, phone gaming revenue, $23 billion, and I'll get into that more shortly. It's like free-to-play, how did they make $23 billion? Well, we will find out shortly. Uh, this just gives you an example, uh, and this is just one game called Roblox, which is um, kind of targeted at kids eight and older. It's gotten a lot of high marks for creativity, um, for uh, the ability to, you know, for kids to kind of learn how to do some minor coding and uh, manipulation and digital environment, some educational stuff. And then it's also gotten some uh, dings for potentially predatory behavior that can occur from some of the older kids or adults who uh, who are creating games in this platform because that's what it's designed to do. It lets you create your own game and then put it out there for other people to, to play. And some of these games um, they were finding, you know, were contained uh, sexualized content or violent content that I think the initial creators didn't anticipate. But this shows you uh, use through time, starting with the fourth quarter of 2018 at the far left, up through the end of this past year, uh, 2021. And um, the access on, on the left is uh, millions of uh, daily uh, users of the platform. So you had about 14 million users a day, end of 2018, kind of slow but steady growth up through the fourth quarter of 2019. And then, of course, we had the pandemic beginning in the first quarter of 2020, pretty good jump and an even bigger jump into the second quarter. And then there's just been kind of massive and continuous growth since then. I suspect we're over 60 million daily users uh, of this game, uh, uh, too. So um, one of the things that uh, the um, World Health Organization did um, is, maybe I missed that slide, huh? maybe I took it out or something, but the World Health Organization just a week or two into the pandemic um, issued the suggestion, you know, you're stuck at home, nothing to do, 
uh, you know, consider playing video games with the family. And a lot of us chuckled because the World Health Organization uh, had about a year before recognized gaming disorder as a real thing. I think they got a lot of um, negative feedback about that suggestion. And they and they a couple of days later put out some some guidance that uh, talked about gaming disorder as well and to keep keep your level of play uh, healthy. But still, they were at least partly responsible for encouraging the uptick. And we saw about a 70% increase in both uh, online gaming and gambling platforms uh, in the first weeks of the pandemic. And those really have not come back down. But why are we playing? So um, a, a lot of us are doing it, hopefully, for most of us, for entertainment, uh, to relieve boredom, which can be a, a double-edged sword, you know, as long as it's not doesn't become just your go-to thing every time to relieve boredom. It's probably okay. Failure is low risk in the digital world, unlike the physical world where failure can have uh, significant consequences in your life. Uh, social connection, a lot of people, kids and adults reported um, uh, the importance of games in their life to uh, maintain social connection with their friends and family. And a lot of people did that through uh, digital games. Um, it can be a good escape, right? We all need that happy place to go to when there's things going on in our life, but again, a double-edged sword. We do not want games or gambling or substances to become our go-to measure for coping, right, with anything that's, that's going on in our lives. Uh, achievement of goals is very measurable in the game. It's, it's very clear how your player is progressing, uh, what that looks like. Um, uh, for the materials you possess, your level, your interaction with other players. There's a sense of certainty and some really specific rules in games that once you learn, those essentially don't change, right? In, in the physical world, that's not necessarily true. There's much more of a sense of personal control in the digital environment. And yes, and parents hate to hear this one, that gaming is a viable career and will be um, uh, for a lot of people. And I'll get into esports hopefully a little bit at the end, but there are many, many universities that are starting to offer partial and even full scholarships uh, for their esports teams. Harrisburg uh, University in Pennsylvania became the first university in the country to offer full ride scholarships to all 23 roster spots of its esports teams. And when you consider the infrastructure needed um, uh, to uh, conduct those tournaments, the venues, uh, coaches, trainers, sports psychologists, the whole thing that we see with uh, physical sports exists uh, and even, even more so in, in some ways in the digital universe of esports. So even for those individuals who aren't good enough to do it professionally, there may be a pathway for them to stay involved. So as you can see, this is not all. This is not all bad news. And I, I don't. While I'm emphasizing gaming disorder in my conversation today, I, I certainly don't want to uh, uh, leave anybody with the impression that gaming is, is bad. Lots of research to suggest there are pro-social aspects, uh, rehabilitative aspects of games for people who are um, recovering from certain illnesses or traumatic brain injuries. It may have some utility and help. Uh, treating uh, returning soldiers who are suffering from PTSD in terms of exposure therapy and some of these first person shooter games. So there, there's a lot uh, positive, but uh, you know, as with, with just about uh, anything, if, if done to excess or for different reasons, it can become a problem. Um, and this was a New York Times article that came out just before the pandemic that asked the question, can you really be addicted to video games? And uh, all sorts of research uh, prior to this time and since uh, suggests it's not far-fetched at all, especially when considering uh, a lot of the societal and cultural factors that make up games uh, today so immersive, continuously updating, never-ending in some cases, much different from the games I grew up with. I think I would have been totally lost if these games had been available when I was a kid, quite frankly. Um, I, they would have helped me escape from a, a tremendous amount of bullying that was going on in my life and that I was embarrassed about, embarrassed to share with my parents. And so I was using some fairly maladaptive strategies uh, to cope with, with things in my life. But that begs the question, you know, when is gaming really a, a problem? And here's how the World Health Organization defines it in the ICD-11. And it's really, really simple. A pattern of gaming behavior, uh, which includes digital gaming or video gaming, characterized by, number one, impaired control. So that inability to consistently set limits, either of, of time or money, 
uh, over your gaming. Um, the second is increasing priority uh, being given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming is starting to take precedence over other interests and daily activities that you want to engage in. And finally, uh, negative consequences. So continuing to engage in games or even escalating gaming behavior despite the occurrence of negative consequences in your life as a result of, of that gaming. And these could be financial, they could be time, they could be work productivity, they could be relationship, right? So it, it, it defines it generally enough um, uh, that there are a lot of things that could fall under that negative consequences categories. And if, if all three of these are true, technically you are clinically diagnosable. Um, but an answer of yes to any one of these, again, is a good time for some brief intervention or, or discussion about these issues. So these are the proposed um, uh, clinical criteria in the DSM-5. I've been looking at these for you know, 10 years, essentially. Now, uh, a lot of us are surprised that it hasn't yet come out. I've heard there are some political reasons that are a part of the part of the reason that they have not yet been published. Um, but if you look at these, what do they look a lot like? Pretty much almost the same as, as what is in there already for gambling disorder, just applied to games. And in fact, when I put these side by side, the, the criteria that already exists for gambling disorder and the proposed criteria for gaming disorder, there's almost a one-to-one -one relationship, except in the areas of isolation and bailouts. And quite frankly, I could make a pretty good argument that both of those things occur with gambling and, and gaming or, or have the potential to occur. So, um, you know, a little bit different than what the World Health Organization has come up with. And this was just published last year. This was a Delphi study conducted with quite a few world experts in both treatment and research that evaluated um, the existing ICD-11 against the proposed DSM-5 criteria, criteria. And what they found and what they reached consensus on was that some of the DSM-5 proposed criteria were not clinically relevant, for example, example, tolerance and deception, and may in fact pathologize non-problematic uh, patterns of gaming, whereas the ones that exist in the ICD-11 are likely to diagnose gaming disorder adequately and avoid pathologizing. So the last thing we want to do is clini clinically diagnose someone uh, with something that that is not clinically significant in their lives, right? It doesn't mean that they're not engaging in some problematic behavior that needs to be addressed but kind of with that do no harm principle, we want to we want to make sure that you know if we're diagnosing somebody with something, it's 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 true, it's diagnosable, it's treatable, and that there is a, a path uh, forward. Oh, I just saw the comments. I met my husband through a video game. Well, I'm fond of saying that I I met all of my wives online in, in different in different venues. Again, a, a different story, but um, yes, one was not quite a gaming uh, environment, but similar. Um, what should I be aware of with video games? So all of us, especially those of us who are parents, should be familiar with the Entertainment Software Ratings Board uh, ratings. These are very much like the ratings that are employed with the movies, uh, right? And they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, e for everyone, every uh, E10 plus, everyone 10 plus, generally suitable for ages 10 and up. The teen category, considered generally suitable for ages 13 and up, is when you can start to see simulated gambling occur within the game. So these are games that are actually teaching you how to play various gambling games. And there are a lot of us, both in the research and treatment communities, are, who are pretty concerned about this because a lot of us feel that we're, we're grooming kids to become interested in actual gambling when they're of age. Uh, to do so. And there's some research that suggests that that, that may happen. Um, the um, uh, M for mature is when you can start to see pretty intense violence, uh, blood and gore, profanity, um, uh, highly uh, sexualized situations. So please be aware if you're buying games for your kids and they're uh, quite a bit younger than 17, uh, really, really be aware that that may not be appropriate. And then of course, at the um, adult category, these actually may contain gambling with real money in the jurisdictions that do allow for that. Uh, all of them uh, are starting to show the reasons for their rating in a little box uh, at the bottom. Uh, they should all tell you whether in-game purchases are allowed uh, and whether or not these include random items. And I'll talk about why that's important here in just a moment. 
Uh, beware some of the games that are marketed as educational, these baby Einstein videos that I used to park my my daughter in front of the TV screen and, and turn on. There's no evidence that they help at all. In fact, uh, you know, at that at toddler age, any educational type um, games or uh, screen programs, you should, you know, the caregiver should be engaging with that child uh, at the same time. But this was one, a game that was marketed to kids as young as five or six. Um, and it did have the ability, believe it or not, to buy add-ons within the game. And of course, a five or six-year-old has no concept of what money is, much less the fact that these games are tied to their parents' checking or credit card accounts. And what was particularly insidious and predatory about this game, which which built itself, you know, as an educational game, your your child could. Uh, learn to be a doctor or a dentist, and you'd have patients that you would treat and try to make better, which all sounds great. And then the screen would pop up encouraging you to buy an add-on. And if you were at least, um, you know, as a parent savvy enough to know this was there and educate your child to click on this red X and close out this program if it ever appeared, if you chose to do so without actually buying something, this image of a crying child would pop up on the screen. So how awful is that, that they're you're making kids feel bad about not spending money on the game? I'm, I'm glad to say this one no longer um, exists, but um, this stuff is still out there. These are pretty popular video games that do have um, a simulated gambling. In fact, in most of them, some type of gambling activity is required to advance through certain levels within the games. Fortunately, these are all rated M for mature, which they should be because of uh, other uh, violence uh, and sexualized situations uh, in them, but they also all contain gambling. So freemium games, what are these? And I alluded to these early on in the presentation. These are games that are entirely free to download and play, but which require money to unlock certain features or progress more rapidly in the game. And I suspect just about all of you will recognize most of these games. Um, and all of these games are entirely free to download and play on your tablet or PC or your phone. Uh, but they all have add-on features where you can buy stuff that help you advance more rapidly or get certain features that will help you be more competitive in the game. 90% of all of the revenue from not only the Apple app stores, but also the Google uh, Play stores are from games that are entirely free to download and play. You can download any of these and play them forever without paying a penny, but 90% of all the money they make are not from subscriptions. They're not from apps that cost you something to download. They're not from the advertising. It's literally from those games and, and the features that people are spending money on within the games. Um, another uh, a feature that is of concern, uh, loot boxes. These are, um, these are uh, very much um, like gambling, uh, even, even though you, know, you, you wouldn't think at first blush, but the persuasive psychology that is used with these features is very much like a slot machine. And these are usable virtual items um, that can be used or opened in the game. They often appear as a treasure chest or some other type of container to receive a random selection of further virtual items. These can be very simple customization options, uh, uh, clothes or uh, skin for a person's uh, that changes a person's appearance or very valuable uh, weapons or armor. And you are buying these in the game. These are not free. These are not things that monsters are dropping because you've killed the monsters. These are items you are spending uh, extra money on almost always in 99 cent increments, right? We all, all know that game uh, from buying gas at our convenience store, 299.9. Um, but 99 cents, $1.99, $99.99, you can spend a lot of money on these features, but you have no idea what you are buying. And that distinguishes them from the freemium games where like, you know, Candy Crush, you know exactly what you're buying when you pl uh, plunk down that extra money. Uh, but with this, it's just the same as putting a dollar into the slot machine, pulling the handle or pushing the button and hoping for that super rare uh, item, you're much likely to get um, uh, very little at all, or things that you could have gotten if you just played the game normally for another hour. But every now and then, you're going to hit that super rare item, right? And it's going to cause the bells and whistles to go off in the reward center of your brain, very much like a slot machine. 
Um, these have actually been defined and regulated as a type of gambling in many countries, and it wouldn't be surprising. We had one senator a few years ago already introduce some legislation to look at this that, that went nowhere at the time. But these things are very uh, prevalent in the Google Play uh, and iPhone stores. And 93% uh, of the Android games and 95% of the iPhone games that featured loot boxes were deemed suitable for kids age 12 plus. A lot of concern. Um, here's some very popular games that have loot box features uh, within them. The ability to um, uh, 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 make these in-game purchases to uh, increase the uh, your your level or other features within the games. Uh, the UK, this is a, an article that came out in the mirror that talked about the kids uh, splashing, uh, chasing losses on games like uh, Fortnite and uh, talked about uh, regulating uh, them as, as gamblers, essentially. Just last year, Germany officially banned uh, games uh, that contain loot boxes for purchase by minors. So you have to be an adult uh, to buy these. There's some education that comes along with this, which is just great. This is something all of us should be educated in school. Uh, you know, at the same time we're talking about substances, we should be talking about gambling and gaming as well, the overlap and why those are uh, adult activities uh, and, and the, the co-occurrence with a lot of these other things that we're much more familiar with. Here's a number of countries that have already regulated loot boxes uh, to some extent. A lot of the concern uh, over loot boxes had to do with, with loot boxes potentially being a, a gateway into problem gambling later on. And this is the only study I'm aware of that has looked closely so far. It's a couple years old now. And this study found, in fact, that there did not seem to be a, a gateway from um, gaming into problem gambling. However, it did find that problem gambling symptoms were positively re related to problematic loot box purchasing. And so this is, this is important. And this is a study that's been replicated many, many times already with many different studies. Uh, and we and so there's a chicken and egg thing going on here that we do not fully understand yet. But until we do, it makes sense to err on the side of caution. We already know that that gambling activities or engaging in gambling activities as a child definitely is a risk factor for developing a disorder later on. So those things that are mimicking gambling activities, we need to be uh, pretty careful with at this point in time. So uh, at this point, I'm going to show uh, a brief video. This is only about six minutes, but I, I think it's always best to hear someone who has some, some lived experience in this area. And this is a remarkable uh, young man named Cam Adair. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him. This, this is a TED Talk that's already uh, eight or nine years old, but still mostly uh, relevant today. He was in his early 20s when he gave this uh, talk. For over 10 years, I was addicted to playing video games. This addiction affected many areas of my life, including being a major influence in my decision to drop out of high school at the age of 15. Eventually, my parents got on my case to get a job, so I got one. I say got because I pretended to have a job for months. Every morning at 7 a.m., my dad would drop me off at the restaurant where I was a prep cook. After he drove off, I'd walk across the street and catch the bus back home sneaking in through my window and going to sleep. I had been up all night playing video games. The truth is, I didn't want to do these things. I just did. The addiction controlled the behavior. Three years ago, I decided to make a change. I had just moved back home to Calgary, Canada from living on Vancouver Island, and I couldn't get over this feeling of immense disappointment in myself. I moved to Vancouver Island inspired to take on new challenges, only to be left playing video games 16 hours a day for five months straight. I felt like a failure, and unfortunately, this was a feeling I knew too well. So I did what anybody would do. I Googled it, and the answers I found... <laughs> and the answers I found were incredibly frustrating. They were suggestions like study more, when the whole reason I was playing video games was to avoid studying, or to hang out with friends when all my friends played video games. Not knowing what else to do, I decided to quit cold turkey. And after a few months, I learned key lessons that led to major breakthroughs in my recovery, 
And knowing others were struggling with this addiction, I decided to share my story. I wrote a blog post online titled How to Quit Playing Video Games Forever. And the response? Overwhelming. But is video game addiction really that big of a problem? I mean, we're talking about video games here. Sure, I had my own personal experience with it, but did this problem scale? Or was I just one of the unlucky ones? Current research suggests that 97% of youth play video games, which equates to 64 million kids in the US alone between the ages of 2 and 17, with the fastest growing age group kids age 2 to 5. In the UK, 10% more kids age 2 to 5 know how to operate a smartphone application than know how to tie their own shoes. Unfortunately, the debate surrounding video games focuses on whether you should play or not. When that's like saying should you drink or not. If you can do it in moderation, that's fine. But what if you can't? What if right now you're stuck at home playing video games and you want to stop and don't know how? Imagine for a second how this makes you feel. Do you feel a sense of pain? What about feelings of guilt? Shame? Do you feel confident, anxious, depressed? Now, this wouldn't be a good TEDx talk unless I shared the lessons I learned and how you can use them to help yourself or someone you know overcome this addiction. It's not about the games, it's about why you play the games. If you can understand why you play games, you can move on from them. There are four main reasons why you play games. First, they are a temporary escape. After a tough breakup at the age of 18, playing games online gave me the perfect way of not having to deal with the situation. I could simply get absorbed in games and play for hours and hours. Second, games are social. Staying home on a Friday night doesn't seem so bad when you're at home playing games with your friends online. Not only that, but games offer a clean slate on the social ladder. Being bullied when I was younger didn't exactly leave me feeling very confident in my social standing. I felt misunderstood, unaccepted, and unsure how to fix it, even though I wanted to. Playing games online gave me this opportunity. I could be who I wanted to be. Nobody knew my history, and I was judged based on my ability to play the game and not on my current social standing. Third, games are a challenge. They give you a sense of purpose, a mission, a goal to work towards. This is an achievement paradigm. Achievements multiply the opportunities to experience success. Finally, you see constant measurable growth. This is a feedback loop. You get to see progress. When you're at school, you struggle to improve your social standing. But online, you're able to see rewards for the efforts you put in. Consider how it feels when you're finally able to see progress in something. Consider how it feels when you're able to see that the goal you've set out for is achievable. Combine these four areas and you have a very addicting process. So where do we go from here? How do we fix this problem? Video game addiction is a habit developed over time by becoming your go-to activity whenever you're bored. So parents, it starts with you. I'm sorry to say, but the iPad is not the new babysitter. They need interaction, not entertainment. Next, gamers play for various... <laughs> Next, gamers play for very specific reasons. Identify their motivations and help them find these in other activities. Help them with their social skills. The truth is, they struggle to make friends. Lastly, don't punish them for their desire to play these games. Come from a place of compassion and encouragement, not judgment. We're so caught up in asking whether this is a real addiction or not that we've lost sight of what truly matters. How do we help these people stop playing video games? But there is another way. The truth is, this is about the idea of feeling trapped in something you want to move on from. It's about the freedom to live your life the way that you want and on your own terms. And sometimes all you need is permission. Permission to move on from something you want to move on from. Permission to stop playing video games. So if you're out there, whether you're in the audience or you're watching at home, I want you to understand one thing. You have permission. Thank you. Okay, so a really remarkable uh, young man that I met um, about the same time he gave it and gave the first presentation we ever had here in our Nevada State Conference. And he, without a uh, even a high school education, developed this website called GameQuitters.com, which is a tremendous resource uh, uh, still today. Uh, he intuitively hit about on a lot of principles that we know about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and, and uh, changing uh, behaviors. Uh, motivational interviewing. He's got tons of short two and three minute videos, which are great for those of us with short attention spans, uh, interactive quizzes um, that are currently based on the proposed DSM-5 criteria. Um, 
and you and you again these support groups uh, they, he's got tens of thousands of members i think he's up over 90 countries now in terms of the the membership and recently realized his his dream of working with psychologists to put put together a clinical uh, training program that now offers a certification in gaming and international certification in gaming disorder which i'll mention here shortly but truly remarkable young man. Here are a few other suggestions, both from him and other psychologists who have looked at this issue. Um, we've all been, I think, condition, conditioned to use the terms virtual world and real world, but both of these uh, confer judgment on the activity. So try to reframe these uh, uh, to the terms digital world and online world, uh, or uh, uh, or online world and the physical world rather than the real world instead, because both of these worlds are subjectively real to the people who engage in them. And then use the term gamer with an individual only if that person self-identifies as a gamer. Many of us who play games don't actually identify as gamers. So this can be further stigmatizing to a group that already sometimes feels stigmatized. Um, and also, I, I guess I've, I left the slide out, but you know why we why we tend to focus in on kids when we're talking about video games. In fact, the average age of today's digital game player is 32 to 34 years old, uh, and has been gaming for about 14 years. One of the fastest growing demographics is 50 plus, especially among women, uh, mostly on tablets and phones and things like that. So this is not a, a, a kid oriented activity by uh, any means. Um, these are just the DSM criteria uh, in the form of a question. You'll all get access, I think, maybe to a, a copy of this presentation so that you can see what these are. I've done the same thing with the ICD-11, which are much simpler uh, and just a few uh, criteria and look like they're going to be uh, more relevant. I suspect when the DSM-5 finally does come out with it, it'll look a lot more like the ICD-11. Um, let's all remember, as with any addictive disorder, there is usually a family or societal impact for, you know, each one of me, there's five to 10 other individuals who are being impacted in some ways, uh, often significantly by my behavior. I love this slide and I use it with both gambling and gaming uh, in this slide. You know, you don't know, is he pissed off at her because she spent $250 playing Candy Crush this month? Or is she upset with him because he's been promising they'd take a, a, a trip up to the mountains for months now and every weekend he's playing Call of Duty with his friends? Or are they upset with each other for not um, knowing that there were parental controls on the game that their six-year-old daughter has been playing and she's run up $13,000 in credit card charges over the past couple of months that they had assumed was fraud, but wasn't. And that's a real story, by the way. Um, I have some questions that I, I use in the schools, especially, but these can be for, for anybody. You know, what can I do as a student gamer uh, to keep gaming at a healthy level, occasionally reviewing the quiz questions, talking with your parents or those of you who are parents, collaboratively, collaboratively talk with your kids about what those daily limits should be and um, you know, have them respect those boundaries. And if they feel that they have input into that process, it's going to be a lot more successful. Um, talking about being fin uh, finishing schoolwork, chores, other obligations before you engage in gaming. So that's seen as kind of a re reward for completing those obligations. And then not using gaming as a means, regular means at least to escape from or avoid responsibilities, problems, or negative emotions, uh, encouraging them to be, uh, you know, address these with uh, an adult. Uh, what if I wanna stop completely, you know, commit to quit gaming for 90 days as an experiment, see how you feel. He has a great list of hobbies, uh, you know, a dozen or two dozen ideas under each of, of some of these criteria to help people replace whatever it is that they're getting from that gaming, whether it's social aspect, escape, goal oriented. He offers uh, lots of physical world hobbies to try and replace those activities in your life. Um, the kids I talk to, you know, in the classrooms, I ask them how many of them consider themselves easily bored, and and usually half to two thirds of the class will raise their hands. Uh, this is a great suggestion about uh, starting to use a daily calendar to schedule out your day, um, and so that you can't use the excuse when you get to a certain point in the day 
um, that, you know, you're bored and there's nothing to do. Even if you don't do that thing you have on your calendar, you can't use, uh, you know, boredom and there's nothing to do as a reason to head straight to the games. And then there are a number of, of different um, uh, communities like Game Gwitters. Reddit has a stop gaming for uh, there's compul compul or Computer Gamers Anonymous. Uh, it's an online 12 step program. As a parent, start talking about these issues early. The research is really clear. If we talk with our kids about sex, drugs, alcohol, gaming, gambling early, they become much more comfortable in having conversations with us when they have questions or problems as arise, certainly much more so than those of us who uh, you know, don't talk with our kids about, about these issues uh, at all. Um, listen to your children. Often it's not the gaming that's the issue. There's something else going on in their lives. Um, you know, help your child develop health, uh, healthy uh, coping skills, monitor their behavior, uh, monitor your checking accounts. Here are some resources. Uh, I, I already shared the self-help resources. For those of you that are interested in pursuing more training, uh, Intenta uh, has a wonderful 15-hour self-guided gaming disorder clinical training. I am not um, you know, uh, uh, certified to provide anybody with treatment, but it was tr uh, tremendously useful for me from a prevention standpoint when I'm talking to groups about this issue. And there's been a, a certification developed through the International Gambling Counselors Certification Board. There are a number of other organizations that have started to develop clinical trainings on this issue. So if you do a little searching out there, you can you can find those. If you're interested in research, you can go to youthgambling.com, which branches off to both gaming and gambling. And therapy-wise, if you've got somebody who, who you really feel is suffering from a gaming disorder who needs treatment, kindbridge.com um, is a national organization that has developed and become licensed, I think maybe in every state now, but they have uh, online counselors who focus on gambling and gaming uh, that are, and it's an insurance-based program in their, these cases. Uh, I did promise to talk a little bit about esports. I'm, I'm kind of running out of time, and I did want to have a few uh, uh, a few minutes for questions. But we are experiencing the largest expansion of legalized gambling in this nation's history in sports wagering. And combined with that, esports has become huge. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that often sells out stadiums. We have an esports arena here in Las Vegas that is associated with one of our casinos. And as long as you're at least 13 years old, you can go and compete on the big screens for real prize money. And if you've got uh, uh, a chaperone who's at least 18, you can do it at younger uh, ages. These show our high schools who now have esports teams across the country. I was unable to zoom in on Minnesota because for some reason they don't have this map on the website uh, anymore, but there are uh, lots of high schools in Minnesota who have esports teams. This is the Minnesota State University, I believe, um, esports team, but uh, there's also a Minnesota esports club that promotes uh, kind of healthy esports across Minnesota. You can check out. These are topics I really didn't have time to get into, and I don't in the uh, this conversation, but these are related and linked. And now I'll get out of this, and sorry I've left so little time here for, for questions, but I, I'll <laughs> there's a massive amount of material. We could do a whole semester course on this easily. All right. Oh, my goodness. So I have four kids, so this is like, okay, I'm not sucking at some of these things. <laughs> some of <laughs> um, Yeah, if... if People want to type in a couple of questions just before we, you know, run out of time. And when, I think we are going to need to bring you back because I do have a lot of like potential treatment questions and things like that. Um, really with gaming and youth, I, there's this kind of trend that at least has been talked about. And I, at least I talk about it with my friends who have kids that are young like mine. And, you know, this whole um, like personality change in kids, like there are some kids when they have screen time, my one son, he could care less. He just just could care less unless it's midnight. Then he wants to. But I, my one daughter, for sure, she plays her iPad for five minutes and she's a demon child. Um, I, I wonder if there's any any kind of things you've seen about that or any kind of thing that kind of associates with that. Sure. So, and, and again, this can be different things for different kids. You know, that young developing brain is such a mystery in some areas, and it's often linked again to what are the what are the specific reasons that they are are playing games, right? What are the motivational factors? Because that's gonna that's gonna drive how you proceed with with treatment. 
um, because there is there's no there's no one case study in this case which which is helpful because each, each individual uh, case uh, can be so different. But it does require becoming familiar with the general um, breadth of the genre type of games, those that are first person shooter, these uh, battle arena type things, the role playing games, the ones that are purely social. Uh, a lot of the kids are using it more as a social activity to to do the stuff with their friends or keep up with their friends. You know, a lot of kids will be involved in the same game. And it's this keeping up with the Joneses idea that gets to some kids. I'm falling behind my friends. And what's the stigma associated with that in my in my peer group? Right. So or if there's something going on in the household that's, um, uh, you know, some type of uh, abuse, whether that's emotional, sexual, physical uh, I certainly, you know, used gaming very early on to escape from a lot of those things uh, that were going on in my family. So uh, it's it's a really complicated question. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's you know, and I think I think what you just said with the social kind of gaming, that's where I struggle, especially like during COVID. And still, it's like their friends are playing it, but yet in my head, I'm like, oh my god, how many like child molesters and rape? You know, like people are going to kidnap my kids are on there too, and so it's trying to like. Yeah, really important to, I mean, a lot of the games for, for young kids, while they can allow you to connect it, there are very specific features you can use to make sure they're only, you know, talking with people they know, for example, really important to know if they're talking with real people and have that conversation about what that can mean. But conversely, for parents, I always, I, I always caution against just removing that connection from the child as a punishment measure where they go from this tremendous engagement to zero because that can actually have more deleterious consequences. Um, and especially from the social connection, these are real friendships that develop, even though they may never meet this person in the physical world, the majority of people are not predatory. Right. And so uh, sometimes those relationships are, are very important. So you need to kind of explore all of these areas with, with your child. And again, collaboratively it is best if, if you can do it that way. Yeah. I, I'm going to, and Kurt and I were in the car one day working and I got a text from my 12 year old mom, mom, or, and then he called, we were working in a meeting and he's calling me and he had been watching something on YouTube. And if you liked it, then he gave you this link and said, download this game and then do this. And then if you're selected as some famous winner or whatever in his group, which of course, pretty much everybody is selected as a winner in my take, um, then you get so many coins for this game. Well, he can download this thing and he gets, which he's got, I did allow him to download the first one to kind of feel out what was actually going on. And the guy's like, you won a free, I don't know, Xbox or not like, but something like that. I'm like, you know, we need your address to send it to you. And I'm like, luckily he called me and said, mom, this is what it says. And he gave me the login information. I was like, no, but it was so hard of a conversation to have to convince my child that this isn't real. Like this doesn't yeah. seem real. This is very uncomfortable. And he started to question this guy that he was texting with from YouTube, um, asked some really good questions of him. And then he started to answer them very fishy. Mm. And he thankfully was able to recognize that this wasn't right, but uh, it's hard, it's very hard. Yeah, no, a lot of people get taken in by those scams and it's certainly not just kids by, you know, kind of, but the younger demographic and the older demographic, right, are the two, two that get hit the hit the hardest, I think, in those areas. But there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, older adults are are gaming now, you know, on their tablets. And um, it's, it's a double-edged sword as with any type of media or technology, right? There's some fantastic positive benefits and, some potential major negative ones. Uh, Cam did not mention it in his talk online, but he did get to the point of suicide with his gaming. He had written out the note to his parents before he had that uh, epiphany moment. So we do have, um, you know, cases of, of kids or adults um, ending their lives over their gaming. It's not nearly as frequent as with the gambling activity, but um, yeah, it's it's it should be should be treated as seriously as any any addictive disorder. Mm. Well, we are running out of time, but I, I think there's probably a couple more questions. You know, do you what do you see as kind of and there must be some work on educational consequences of gaming? Has there has there been much done on that? 
Um, when you say educational consequences, um, yeah, guess, not in school much as he did, right? Like not being able to finish school grades. Oh. Right. So that just goes into that general negative consequences category, right? Which, which I love because it en enables you to transfer that into any realm of life. But it's very clear with a lot of kids I talk with in the schools that they are, you know, gaming is one of their go-to activities to avoid doing homework that they don't want to do, right? Because it's so much more uh, appealing. They can put it off. And so, you know, there's an understanding in my household uh, with my daughter, who's just turned 17, uh, just started her senior year, loves Fortnite, uh, but she's known for many years what a loot box is, and she's not allowed to make those purchases. She can make some purchases, but they they have to be non loot box related and they have to be with her own money. And, um, you know, I, I can appear at any moment over her shoulder to see what's going on in that game. Uh, I really encourage parents to do that. And maybe in some cases you'll get interested in the game yourself and you can do it as a family activity, right? Sometimes. So there's, um, there's some uh, positive benefits. And of course, a lot of teachers will use games, you know, digital games now uh, for positive educational experiences within the classroom or even outside of the classroom, right? So there's, it, it's still such a new research field, field that I think we, we don't know the half of, uh, of any of this, but. Um, I just wanted to to, to mention something because uh, Heather was saying for the the change in people's attitude. My husband and I are pretty pretty hardcore gamers ourselves uh -huh. um, and stuff. So, but there's also been a very big change or a shift for a lot of the the terms of services for a lot of the games that the things that people say on the game or even outside the game on YouTube on Twitch and things that people can still and they'll get banned. And they'll lose all their account and everything associated with that. So, and that's been pretty, that's been a, we've noticed that a very big switch from previous times as far as saying anything, the grooming, anything that you say on or off the platform is still against uh, terms of service. Yes. And Twitch, uh, you've probably seen in the news recently, just this past month, there was um, one of their, one of their influencers or streamers who essentially scammed a lot of his followers and friends and, family even out of about $300,000 to support a gambling habit. You know, he was streaming gambling related activities. Uh, Mid-October, I think they're actually going to, you, you won't have that uh, content on Twitch anymore, which is, is pretty important. I'm glad to see they're, they're treating some of this seriously and having the conversations at least, because uh, again, there are so many streamers that are being exposed to somebody else's gambling, right? And getting attracted to whether it's within a game or actual gambling activities, uh, that's a, this is a, a potential big, big problem. Oh, we probably could come up with a million more questions. So you will be getting a please come back email, <laughs> email from Katie. So thank you so much. Um, Absolutely. I've really enjoyed it. And, and again, please uh, reach out to the Minnesota Alliance. Uh, they can even have, they'll have some even briefs, I didn't bring any this time, but some of those brief screening tools that all of you, whatever organization you're in, uh, can uh, work into the questions you ask at intake or before discharge to help identify um, gambling, especially. I don't know if those have been developed clinically, the brief brief intervention questions for gaming, but wow. the gambling ones I think are, are critical and they're easy to put in there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again. I, we really honestly enjoyed that talk. It's just so interesting to all of us, I think. So, so thank right. you. And thank goodness my kids are like adults. And They're adults, <laughs> but they have kids. So yeah, here we go. <laughs> Great. Thank well, thank you very much. We'll see everybody later.